The agenda is set. I'm Brent Goff in Berlin. It's time to talk. Iran and the West, a new beginning or a false start with a big smile? The give and take of forming a new government in Germany. Who wants to really share power? And Greek lawmakers arrested as a crackdown on the far right begins. Welcome to the show, everyone. I've invited three people today to talk, argue, and pry apart these headlines. My first guest usually explains events and politics here in Germany to his readers back home in Greece. But today he's turning things around. He's helping to explain Greece to the rest of the world. I'm happy to welcome to the show Theo Kuvakis. He is the Berlin correspondent with a major daily paper in Greece. Theo, it's good to have you on the show. My second guest is a rising star in German Chancellor Angela Merkel's CDU party here in Germany. I'm happy to welcome back to the show Benedict Puttering. He's been here before, and he's going to be our future government insider today on the show. Benedict, good to have you back here today. And my next guest is an insider as much as anyone here in the West can be when we talk about Iran's diplomatic calculus. I'm happy to welcome to the show Adnan Tabatabai. He is a respected analyst on Iran here in Berlin. And we're going to open it up with you, Adnan. Maybe you can shed some light on what it was we saw at the United Nations um, last week with the president of Iran. What was going on there, really? Well, I believe that uh, for the first time after years or maybe even decades, we have the situation that we have actors in Iran as well as in the United States who seem to be genuinely interested in rapprochement, in um, setting up some kind of relation, relationship in a quite cautious way, but still I think this is what we are seeing and this is what we saw in New York in particular. That, I mean, that, that's a very, as a positive spin uh, on, what, on what we're seeing right now. Um, let me ask everybody at the table, um, are we seeing the end of the ice age between the West and Iran with what we saw last week. What do you think, Benedict? I would say um, it seems to be that at least the ice is melting a little bit um, because uh, for the first time since 30 years there was direct contact between an American president and uh, President Wania. I think that's something uh, uh, what is really special, but we have to, to see where it goes. What do you think, Theo? You know, good news? Or should we be more cautious? Uh, no, I think it's good news. Even uh, starting to talk is good news. Because uh, we remember when India and Pakistan uh, tested their, uh, their atomic bombs, their nuclear bombs, uh, Iran was uh, not even uh, a topic of conversation in, in this milieu. Uh, now it is. And uh, it's going to come into the conversation with a little bit more respect from other nations. Yeah, and and, and I think that's, uh, that, that's good for diplomacy. That's good for diplomacy. And, and a lot of people are saying, of course, they're crediting um, the new president in Iran for that. Iran's president, Hassan Rouhani, may be the unexpected darling in the diplomatic world right now, but his move toward the West, albeit symbolic right now, it made some of his own countrymen see red. Hardliners in Tehran threw eggs and shoes at his car when he returned from New York, and they shouted, death to America. Now, Rouhani may know how to work a crowd in New York, but at home, he's working on his ability to walk a very politically charged tightrope. Iranian President Hassan Rouhani has started an unprecedented charm offensive in a bid to thaw frosty relations with the West. Speaking at the UN last week, Rouhani promised he would work with world leaders to make Iran's controversial nuclear program more transparent. He also spoke by phone with President Barack Obama in the first diplomatic contact with the U.S. in over 30 years. But the Iranian olive branch has met with mixed reactions back home. Rouhani's turn westward has angered hardliners. His supporters hope the diplomatic overture will help end international sanctions that have hurt Iran's economy. Is Rouhani genuinely trying to reset relations with the international community? 
Adnan, is what we're seeing, is it Rouhani's idea? Well, in fact, I believe it is because um, if we consider his political biography and also the political biography of the people he has invited into his government, then these people are, uh, are much more open to relations with particular Western countries and also the United States. Therefore, I believe it is his idea and the important fact here is that he, at least for the moment, seems to have uh, the s important backing of the Supreme Leader in his efforts to establish some kind of relationship or contact with the United States. I mean, he is, he's been given the authority by the Supreme Leader to, to try and change diplomacy right now. Um, I also, I think I remember reading that he also asked to be in charge of the nuclear program, that the President's usually not in charge of that, and he's been given that authority. Um, so. It sounds like we're looking at a president who wants to move the country in a different path, but the supreme leader is, for now at least, on the same page with him. He is. I mean, um, it, it goes without saying that, that the supreme leader is the one person with the final decision on important policy issues such as the nuclear dossier. And the fact that he was, that Rouhani was able to transfer this dossier out of the Supreme National Security Council right. into the Foreign Office is uh, one important step, I would say, and shows that he is making, uh, that this dossier is now a, a policy field of, of the Foreign Office and no longer a national security issue where you have taboos on talking about it and a highest possible conf uh, confidential um, situation on it. And uh, this move was approved by the Supreme Leader, which I believe is uh, of utmost importance. Are we seeing the strongest Iranian president that we've seen in at least 15 years, 20 years? Arguably so, yes. Because with the help of actors like Hashimi Rafsanjani and also mm -hmm. Mohammad Khatami, Rouhani got popular, got, has got a popular basis, yeah. and at the same time um, enjoys trust and full authority towards the elites of the regime. And this combination um, is quite unpre unprecedented, I would say. Is, um, is the responsibility now that um, people are saying is with the West, in other words, to, act, to react now to Iran. Um, is, is that an accurate analysis of where we are right now? Has Rouhani thrown the ball to the West? I think um, it's now a time for a kind of a double strategy. You know, on one hand, we have to, to follow the new path of uh, diplomacy and, and talks, as Obama is doing. But on the other hand, we cannot be naive. So we have to go on with checking what are they doing. Is it not only a smart move to gain time uh, for their nuclear program? Because I think we have to be uh, everything but naive in, in, in this uh, question. Because the whole region is in a very difficult uh, situation uh, right now. So for, also for the Iranians, it would make sense to just to, to make a smart move to gain some time uh, to... Uh, to lower a little bit the risk of an intervention, for example, made by the Israelis. I, I'm just wondering how much substance there really is here, though, in this desire to really improve relations. I, um, I let me ask you know, the, the other journalist here at the table, um, Theo, do you think this president has been schooled on how to be the most media savvy president they've ever had? And that's what's making everybody get goosebumps when he walks in the room. It could be that. He's, uh, he's following his line for quite a long time now, many, many years of what I've seen in research. But I think we should uh, consider as a magic word sanctions. Sanctions. Okay. Uh, Iran is suffering with the sanctions. And I think one of the main uh, topics uh, to be discussed would be that. And, uh, well, can we talk about success? of the sanctions. The fact that we have someone like Rouhani in power saying these things is proof that the sanctions are working. Sanctions are working one way or another because uh, they stop the flow of uh, quite important items, okay, one way and another. Uh, but I mean, have we reached that point now where, you know, we've broken the back, where they, they, they have to relent on something? I mean, the Germans no, I don't want think, that, I, don't they? I, I don't think uh, Iran is down to its knees. No. Because of the sanctions. I don't believe that. Uh, it, 
it would be a lot better for the economy and for the society if the sanctions were lifted or lessened. But uh, there, I mean, there's a lot going on, though. I mean, there's a lot going on inside Iran, too, uh, isn't there, Adnan? I mean, the demographics obviously have changed a lot in the last 30 years. And the president, I mean, Rouhani, he has to look around and realize that he has a nation full of young people. Um, they need a reason to get up in the morning. Absolutely. And I think um, certainly sanctions played a role. And, uh, but they're just one factor out of many who have led to this um, shift in how to, to uh, approach Western countries. Let me um, ask you, as, you know, you're, you're the, the insider here. Would you say the sanctions have worked? Well, it depends on how um, you would, um, how you frame it. I mean, in terms of causing economic troubles in Iran, then certainly they had, they had an, a major impact. Um, leading Iran to, to, to the, uh, close to an economic collapse, no, this was not the case. Um, the, econo the economy is quite stable, which does not mean that it is um, growing and that there's, that there's actually positive um, developments going on there. But at the same time, the, the aspirations of the people and also um, the different political strands that exist in, inside the country who have always been pushing for uh, more political openness. Well, you were just there in August, right? Right. Uh, so, so what's the mood there? I mean, um, if you were to walk up and talk to you know, someone in, in a coffee shop or something, um, what are they going to say? Well, um, from what I sensed when I was there yeah. through the many conversations, uh, there is some cautious optimism. And this uh, optimism, in my point of view, comes out of some um, kind of political maturity where being naive, for instance, is not an option. The people know that the things that they demand from Rouhani, um, the improve, improving the economic situation, improving the situation of civil rights, um, they are fully aware of the fact that the president will need a lot of time um, to, to tackle these issues and to address these issues, but they are quite positive that these people who are in Rouhani's government are the right people to do so. You talk about civil rights. Um, I, I'm wondering if, there's going, if we're going to get just a lot of, of window dressing on this issue from Rouhani, and I'll tell you why I, I'm worried about that. Um, his Twitter account was changed as soon as his plane left New York and headed towards Iran. You know, he had tweeted, or someone in, um, in his, on his team had tweeted these really nice tweets about the, the conversation with President Obama and about um, him telling Obama that America is a great country. And all of those things disappeared as soon as they left the United States. Um, and then, of course, access to Twitter was stopped. That doesn't speak well for a country that wants to improve the rights of its peoples, does it? Um, well, first of all, I wouldn't really view Twitter as an important indicator here. I would rather shed light on... Um, but they know the world is looking at that. I mean, when he was here, where, when he was in New York talking to the public, everyone was following him on, on Twitter. The yeah, buzz absolutely. was there. Yeah. I mean, they're, they're, they're using Twitter as, as well as Facebook for what I would say some kind of cyber public diplomacy. But um, for, for, own people for, for what access. you were referring to, like the civil rights, yeah. there, are much, there are different things of, of much higher relevance inside the country. Releasing political prisoners mm -hmm. is one important factor. And of course, uh, releasing prisoners one week before going to New York has been quite, uh, quite a smart move. Mm -hmm. But we have to consider who was released. Um, Nassim Sotoudeh, of course, alone would have been uh, a PR coup um, uh, that would have uh, been sufficient to amaze the international community. Right. But also there were um, high rank reformist politicians like Mohsen Aminzadeh released who are outspoken critics who in my point of view are politically um, or let's say in terms of political uh, openings much more relevant um, than for instance Nassim Sotoudeh who is an international star if you will. Right. So therefore these are actually the things going on inside the country a part of other things that indicate that there might be some improvement in terms of civil rights. Okay, I mean you, you feel good right now about it. I mean but Germany feels good about what's happening. I think first of all I think the, the sanctions worked uh, uh, very well because without the sanctions I think there would, wouldn't uh, be um, any 
kind of political change in Iran right now, because then people like Ahmadinejad would still be, I think, uh, uh, pretty strong. For us, I think for the international community, the most important thing is the nuclear program. Mm -hmm. So we want to be sure that they are not uh, 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 able to, to have a, 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 nuclear, a nuclear bomb. That's, I think, the main... Also concerning towards Israel, uh, that's the main issue. I mean, are we going to get that? I mean, what's the timeline for Rouhani right now, Adnan? I mean, he doesn't have an eternity to change things around, does he? Well, obviously. I mean, the point is if we are, um, I mean, you just, you just mentioned the most important thing in your view is the nuclear issue. Um, I believe the most important thing should be the well-being of Iran's people before anything else. I mean, in terms of national, international security, obviously, the nuclear issue um, plays a major role um, for, for your perspective. But what I would, in general, expect... Um, European countries in particular, Western countries, democracies, is having in mind what's best for the people inside the country. And if um, Rouhani and his government know how to improve the situation inside the country, and it takes time, we should give them all the time in the world. But we're on the nuclear issue, though, before we move on, if, if he does not have substantive progress within six months to a year, he's going to disappear, isn't he? Well, I, I can't really tell um, how patient or what, uh, what a window of opportunity is granted to him by Western countries. All no, I know is... I'm talking about what the West is giving. I'm talking about what the Supreme Leader is giving him. The Supreme Leader and the hardliners, they're, being, they're giving right now. They're saying, okay, this is your chance. But everything yeah. I've read has said that the timeline is short. And, and, and that's my question to you. I mean, what in do you fact, see a year from now? In fact... Um, we have read things on, uh, on Der Spiegel about possible um, things Rouhani might put on the table about um, opening the Fordo um, site, uh, reducing enrichment up to a level of 3.5 or even 5%. Um, I can't tell whether these information are accurate or not, but these points are on the table, and, okay. and Mr. Zarif uh, reiterated that in his interview with ABC. Um, and then, of course, the other question is um, sanctions. Because we have to wrap it up. Yeah, sanctions are not just something. There are, there are laws, and in order to, to lift them, um, it's not as easy as we think to lift sanctions. Yeah. They have to be there as well. The, okay. the lift, uh, lifting sanctions is important there as well. All right. All right, we need to move on, and we're going to move now to right here in Germany. You can call it one of the ironies of political life in this country. The campaign leading up to the national election lasted exactly six weeks. How long should it take after the election to form a new government? Well, as it looks now, Germany may still have its old government when 2014 begins. No one is rushing to share power with Chancellor Angela Merkel and her conservative CDU. But the problem is the CDU did not win enough votes to govern alone. So here's another irony. The winners of the election need a loser the Social Democrats, and the Social Democrats, as losers, have made it clear they are in no rush. German Chancellor Angela Merkel led her Christian Democrats to a resounding victory in September's general election. But with her coalition partner of choice, the business-friendly FDP failing to make it into Parliament, Merkel will have to reach across the aisle to form a new government. Both the Greens and the Social Democrats have said they're open to coalition talks, but not without major concessions from the Chancellor. The SPD wants to raise taxes on Germany's highest earners to pay for new public spending. That's something Chancellor Merkel has refused to support. Will the Christian Democrats have to break campaign promises to form a government? That's the big question, isn't it, Benedict? Of course. You guys are going to have to... You're basically, you're going to have to go back on your word that you made before the election in order to put a government together. Of course. It's always the case after elections. Uh, if you uh, oh, come on. Didn't, didn't win the absolute it majority... Wasn't the that case, you have it wasn't to, the case four years ago. That you have, yeah, because there it was clear that we uh, can form a government quite, quite uh, quick uh, with uh, the Liberals. Yeah, but, so this is an unusual situation to be in. Yeah, of course, you cannot expect that uh, the result of an uh, election is always the same. So uh, it's every time. It's, it's, it's uh, a little bit different. So in this 
This time we have the, the Greens in the Parliament and also the, the Social Democrats. Uh, and also the link, but uh, I, we will not uh, have uh, talks with the, with the link left party. with the left party. Right. Um, so I think uh, it's it's now time for uh, talks and negotiations. Are you course. surprised at how quickly the euphoria of the CDU win evaporated? Um, Actually, no, because uh, it was clear already at the, the eve of, of the uh, elections um, that we have a different situation uh, towards uh, building, uh, forming a new government, because the liberals, they are out now. But people were really excited about of course, Angela because it was a great the CDU. It, it, of course, because it was a great victory for the CDU and the union, yeah. for the party. Yeah. But uh, the party is one thing. So, but of course, and you are happy as, as a party member that you've won and that you have a great result and yeah. that Angela Merkel is, is stronger than ever. But on the other hand, you see, uh, will it be uh, difficult to, to form a government? And that was uh, quite uh, uh, more or less. Uh, no one was talking about that on election night. You know, you and I spoke right. on election night and, and um, I asked you about, you know, the feelings mm -hmm. um, after, you know, finding out that your party had, mm -hmm. had, you know, brought in the most votes it had seen since. Mm -hmm unification of the country. Right. Um, I just want to play a part of that interview. Let's just go back in time now mm -hmm. and look at um, the mood you were in on that night. Let's play it. I, I do not exaggerate if I say I had a kind of goosebumps uh, more or less everywhere. It was really, really a great sign and also uh, that she mentioned us because we fought so hard for that, for this victory here. But I think all members of the CDU, CSU uh, did, did their job very well and tonight it's time to celebrate and uh, together with our Chancellor we are, let's say, uh, back on track. It's a very good sign to have more now than 40% uh, in the elections. I mean, do you still stand by that? The goosebumps are gone, uh, I can say, but um, of course there was an euphoria uh, uh, that night because the party uh, was, was quite strong. But uh, today it's more, you know, everybody is more a bit uh, sober, let's say, and, and we see that it's tough to find a new I government. Mean, I, 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 think, I think you're being, um, you know, I, I don't think you want to be brutal mm -hmm. with us here about the situation. Mm -hmm. right. um, I think that when people look at the election, mm -hmm. They get angry at the CDU. They get angry with the German voters because they were so close to having the, the majority needed to rule alone. No, I, I disagree because... It's uh, like they gave you no, weapons it, no, no, and no, said you can't it, use no, them. It's, I, I disagree. It's, it's, it's a little bit different because we, we, we see that the liberals, it was quite really close that they uh, failed to, towards the 5% and also with the AFD. So there are two parties that were that took, votes away. took vo votes away. So that was only the, uh, the, that's created the situation that it would have been possible to get the absolute majority which is because we, we, we didn't get 50% yeah. of the votes. That's quite unusual. I would say, and there, there's no reason to be angry with the German uh, electoral and, and German voter because there is a clear uh, 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 sign and yeah, but, majority for a foreign government. Yeah, but you can't put that, I mean, you can't, you know, you can't create a government based on what the, the majority, you know, as of you course. see it, you can't do it because you don't have any coalition partners. You have to bring the SPD in. I mean, let's, let's ask, you know, from outside the country, I mean, the Germans are kind of, they're, they're between a rock and a hard place right now. Or how do you see it, Theo? Well, it, uh, we have to interpret the result of the election. One way of seeing it is, yes, uh, Chancellor Merkel triumphed. And the CDU with her. The other way of seeing it would be, uh, what percentage of German voters actually voted for the government, the outgoing government, the incumbent? Uh, and I see that if we do our math, we will see that out of the uh, 62 million take, take out those who didn't vote, uh, so it's less, and we see that we are talking about a majority that of... Is cent that is center-right. That is center-right, which is uh, by no means the majority of the voters. One thing, put aside. Second. <coughs> All political parties in Germany know that if you are in a coalition, you burn your fingers and you burn your wings. Well, yeah, and that's happened to the, the Social Democrats. So, so. That's what happened to the Social Democrats, that's what happened to the Liberals. Right. Uh, especially when uh, Chancellor Merkel said, we are not going to support them this time. We did last time and we saw that we lost too many votes and that made us 
Too weak. Yeah, she's not a good partner, is she? She's Benedict. an excellent partner. She's excellent for her party, but well, I know, but she's you not know, good for she's the not partner. if you're not in her party. I, I think she, she she's an excellent uh, chancellor for Germany, and I think that's the most important thing. But with the Social Democrats, I have to disagree a little bit because we've seen them in government, and after we had the Grand Coalition, they they received a little bit more than 24 percent or something. But now they've been in opposition for four years, and it didn't didn't improve very much. They only gained a, a few percentages. So the argument that uh, uh, um, they need to be in opposition to gain strength again. It's, it's, it's not... It's but at not, the uh, end of uh, the day, the law is the law, and y you have no choice but to take the Social Democrats to make a, co a coalition. I think at the current moment, everything can happen. We will have uh, talks uh, starting this Friday with, with the, the Social Democrats. Yeah. Next week, we'll have talks with the Greens. And, and do, also that we... Do you believe then, Adnan, do you think that we're going to see, you know, people like our friend here, Benedict, governing with the Greens? Well, in, in fact, I would go a step back also, and I really believe this victory is, is a very personal victory of Angela Merkel, and less so of the CDU, as CSU, as a, as, a, as a party. That's just one take. I mean, you, you may challenge this. And this makes, of course, <clears throat> these talks now a bit difficult, because it's less focused on the program and content, but, but rather on the but person. But isn't, isn't the reason it's, it's, it's a hollow victory for... Benedict's party, isn't the, the, the problem here is that the CDU and the SPD, the, the Christian Democrats and the Social Democrats, um, they almost look like twins politically now. So um, there's not a lot to argue over. I would, I would um, agree to some extent with Benedict also about um, the fact that the C SPD, the Social Democrats, they failed to do their homework in the past four years. Therefore, as you say, look quite similar on some, on some points. And if you now discuss what are the different issues they need to settle for a coalition, probably they will come to an agreement and there, will, there won't be major what are we, differences. What are we going to have an agreement on? Minimum wage? I think, first of all, um, you have to say what from the Social Democrat side. I, I really uh, think it's not, it's not correct and not right. They are only, they do not want to enter a grand coalition because for tactical reasons of their party. Well, what do, you want them, what do you want them to give you? You do not want, <clears throat> you do not want to raise taxes. I think, right? the, 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 of course, of course. We said in our program during the campaign, we don't want to raise taxes. And that is, 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 is still uh, our position. So we will enter probably every talk uh, and not me, but but the leaders of our party uh, uh, with with our program, and then you have to uh, to do afterwards. If you you say okay, you want to start uh, negotiations, uh, then you have to work on it on every single issue. It's not about a party uh, now; it's about the country. It's about and then you have to discuss the issues. About and if the issues. Find, so it sounds yeah. like a campaign all over again. No, it's not a campaign yeah, all over again, but the people like. at the table have to be serious. Mm -hmm. So if, as social democrat or as, as somebody else, you cannot say, I don't want to enter a coalition because I'm afraid that my party is not looking good or that we are losing percentages for the next elections. It's about finding a common position, which is uh, uh, assuring that you have a stable coalition for the next four years. And I don't see that at the very moment uh, with the social democrats. I think at the moment they are only thinking about what is good for their own party. As all parties do. What about new elections, Theo? People well, are that people would now. Be a first for, but people are now Germany. saying that um, out loud. I mean, I have heard people saying that new elections could be I, a possibility to fix this problem. I don't think that uh, the, the German political environment is uh, mature enough to go to this kind of a risky situation where they call the Germans back to the polls because. The parties cannot form a government. That would uh, bring disgrace to the, gov to the parties. Mm -hmm. And I don't think they want to do it. I don't, th I don't think the Social Democrats are willing to risk being blamed well, for Germany not having a, well, it's a like, government. Well, it's like I said at the beginning. It's give and take. And my question to you, Benedict, is what is the CDU willing to give the Social Democrats to get them to come on board? I, I don't think um, that it's always, you know, first we start, we will start the talks on Friday and then our party leaders have to discuss uh, if they are willing to start the negotiations. And during the negotiations, you have to find a way to reach an agreement. Um, and I think that, you know, I, I, I think, and that's the most important thing, that you are not doing these things uh, uh, with, with, with the whole German public. 
because if you want to reach an agreement, it's not about telling uh, uh, everybody in advance in, in TV or in the radio what your red line is and that you are strict here and there and that you will not cross it and so on and so on. That's time when the leaders are sitting together and then uh, trying to find a way to, to get this uh, country governed. We, 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 need, we need to move on, but I know um, our audience, it's international. They, all, they know Angela Merkel and a lot know the finance minister of this country, Mr. Okay. Schäuble. Yeah. Um, if there is a grand coalition, is he going to be able to remain the finance minister? I think it's not the time to discuss that now, because first uh, it's about the programs and to find an agreement about the, the most important issues, and then about uh, uh, who's uh, running uh, mm -hmm. which uh, ministry and so on and so on. It's not the time now to discuss the positions, because that's what, really what, the what last What's your gut thing. tell you, then we have to move along? Pardon? What does your gut tell you? Is Schäuble going to stay finance minister or not? I think he did a good job. That's all right. I'm going to let you give us that politician's answer there, Benedict. We're going to move on now to another political crisis, but this one is in Greece. The government there is introducing legislation to make racist hate speech a crime. Now, it's part of a crackdown on the Golden Dawn Party, the third largest party in the country. Now, Golden Dawn has surged in popularity since the beginning of the Euro crisis. The party blames foreigners and immigrants for the country's economic woes. Its rhetoric is aimed at dividing society. And the signs are now there that Golden Dawn may be behind violence and even murder. Over the weekend, the Greek government arrested members of the far-right Golden Dawn Party. The crackdown came days after an alleged supporter stabbed an anti-fascist rapper to death. The killing struck a nerve in Greece and focused attention on Golden Dawn's fiercely anti-immigrant rhetoric and the racist attacks carried out by its supporters. But Golden Dawn still remains the third strongest party in the Greek parliament. Greece still depends on bailouts to prop up its fragile economy, and Golden Dawn's rise to power has come in part thanks to popular resentment over harsh austerity measures imposed by international creditors. With no end to austerity in sight, can Greek democracy survive the challenge from the right? That's a very good question, Thea. What is your feeling? Can, you, can, can your country keep the far right in check right now? Yes, I think it can. Uh, it can keep the far right in check as far as illegal um, actions are concerned not as far as political actions are concerned. If, if they go on talking about how much they love uh, national socialism and how much they adore uh, Adolf Hitler and stuff like that, okay, they might be also become a little bit ridiculous. Uh, but they've been but doing as it far now. As they've been doing they've it, been but getting... that was not their main point. That's not why they had 16% in, in polls. Lately, uh, the reason they had 16% in polls was why was because they started distributing soup and food to people who didn't have uh, only to Greeks, only to Greeks, right? Uh, plus aid, other type of aid towards them, um, and uh, they are riding the wave of six years of austerity, uh, six years of depression economic depression and uh, psychological depression for many, many, many Greeks. So people who are depressed and they are desperate and they're uh, one out of three people is out of work and uh, two out of three youngsters are out of work, they are willing to listen to whoever promises a bright, honorable future. Okay. That was until it was made clear that these neo-Nazis are a gang of, of criminals. They don't hesitate to murder, they don't hesitate to extort, uh, selling protection to nightclubs and uh, um, stuff like that. I mean, it, it, puts, it puts the country and the government is now in, in a difficult situation because um, members of parliament have been arrested. I mean, that's the first time, I think I was reading the first time since 1974 that something like that has happened in Greece. Yeah. Um, so this anti-hate 
um, speech law is aimed at a section of the Greek parliament. I mean, there, there's, a, there's a lot of, um, you know, When Greece emerged self from, from seven years of dictatorship, mm -hmm. 1974, it rebuilt the constitution and things were rather tense and nobody dared say we are going to prohibit people from believing that Nazism is good or whatever. Uh, mind you, the Communist Party was illegal until then in Greece. So they said, no, we are not going to draw any lines. And if they're not, going, they're, they're not trying to get rid of the, the party either by banning it. They're, right they're, now, they're not trying to ban the party. Right, they, right now, they're discrediting the, the, the party by uh, providing evidence that from the leadership down, it is a gang of criminals, mm -hmm. common criminals, who under the pretext of political activities, uh, did criminal stuff. Okay. That's, it's as simple as that. that, that strategy, I, that, that's a strategy that, that, you know, that, that could work if... There's no the, other legal option. Right, there's no other, right. But I mean, they have to basically starve the party too, um, with, by, by denying starve it the from, money. Uh, fi starve it financially and uh, in, the, in the eyes of the citizens when they realize, okay, we might be a little bit mad with the government, this government, the previous government, and the one before that, because they were all... Uh, corrupt or incompetent or both, uh, now people will not side by, by the ones they know they are murderers, they are uh, violators, they are thieves, they are uh, blackmailers. Let, let me ask you this, and, and we can you know, open it up about, about how the world sees what's happening in Greece and how the Greeks um, see it. We've seen so many caricatures of the German Chancellor Angela Merkel in the Greek media uh -huh. in the last four years. Uh, is the Greek media telling the people the truth about the causes of the crisis and about the accountability and where it should be directed in Greece? If you say media in general, I will tell you there's no such thing in Greece. In Greece you have either the systemic media the ones who worked with this government, the previous government, the one before that, and all the governments, the one who were taking, um, receiving contracts for publicity of public whatever, and... So you're talking okay, about... There are two types the, of media. Yeah. There are media who say, okay, we've done a very lousy job in electing our governments and letting them uh, work as they want in order to bring too much debt not any uh, productive investment. That's why the economy is in this kind of uh, a really bad situation and it's not going to come out of this bad situation because the Germans are going to give us, give us some more loans. Well, I mean, but the Germans are criticized all the time in the media. I mean, Benedict, let me ask Benedict, how, I mean, what do you say to this? Is, is, are, are the Greek people given the chance to even know the truth about how much help has been given to them already uh, in the austerity. I think first of all um, it's very important that we as uh, also as Germans um, are being cautious you know with giving advice what you know what to do in Greece and, and giving advice to the to, to, to the government how to deal with, for example, this thing now with Golden Dawn and so on and so on. But on the other hand, if I see pictures with Angela Merkel, uh, um, uh, with the, the, the Nazi, uh, Swastika. Uh, yeah, and, and, and so on and so on, that makes me uh, kind of sad because I, I think we have the same, uh, the same aim to bring Greece back on track. But on the other hand, I also can understand the people in Greece because they are suffering really uh, uh, a lot and that for now more than five years. So I, on, on, I think the, you have to blame the politicians uh, uh, before the crisis for not doing their job. And do you, what do you say to that? Well, I, I would be a bit um, more hesitant to speak about shared aims and about um, that the goals of... German politicians or the EU towards Greece are shared by the people of Greece or the, let's say, politicians in the country. Um, 
they I agreed on it. I think, well, um, I remember the reactions from France and Germany when they said we want to put um, some of the EU decisions to a referendum. Um, what kind of messages were sent to, to Greece from, from France and Germany. That was a bit um, confusing with regards to the, well, very basic democratic um, values that we have. And obviously, wherever um, a crisis is, is, is there, uh, extremism flourishes. And I, I think you made a very good point in saying that the people did not vote these Golden Dawn members into parliament for their um, for admiring Hitler, but for being there in social, uh, socially problematic uh, environments. Um, and in general, it's a major task for every democracy to deal with radicalism and to deal with and to draw the line between where can we be, can we be tolerant towards radical elements and currents and what is the absolute um, red line to... And, and yeah. I mean, you know, and we have to wrap up um, here, but at the end of the day, the, the rise of Golden Dawn, um, it's about the Greek people feeling like their leaders in Greece let them down. That's a fact. Leaders of Greece let people down for the last decades. And it's a fact. Nobody can deny that. Uh, one other thing we have to see is why did the political system accept having Golden Dawn as an equal partner? Where to you speak? go to this thing about how much tolerance there, do you they have? They were too tolerant and they were too ready to connect this side of the political spectrum to the other so-called side end of the political very spectrum. Very briefly, yes or no, is it too late with legislation to stop? Golden Dawn in this trend. Yes no, or no? No, it's not too late. Okay, good. We can end on a positive note. Gentlemen, thank you very much for coming on the show. That is going to wrap up this edition of Agenda with Brent Goff. Remember, you can contact me anytime with your thoughts on the show. You can find me on Facebook and on, you can tweet me at Brent Goff TV, and you can email me as well. You see the address on the screen. If you want to watch the show again, go to DW's website or watch us on YouTube. I'm Brent Goff in Berlin. Join me next time when I set the agenda.